If you're online researching Carolina bays, chances are you're going to be seeing the same features over and over again. They're from a specific location in coastal plain, North Carolina, and you will not be seeing landforms like the ones that are on the screen right now. And those are big sand dune sheets. Uh, these are absolutely abundant in the Atlantic coastal plain. You don't know they're there today because they're not actively forming. They're covered with vegetation. And in fact, a lot of them actually come from the edges of the Carolina bays themselves. Now, the image you're looking at here is in the coastal plain of South Carolina, down south of the town of Denmark, South Carolina. Most of the bay media that you see today is from the Cape Fear or Lumber River Valleys in the coastal plain of North Carolina. And that's where you're going to find those just perfectly elliptical incline bays that stack up on each other. They're very dramatic to look at, but looking at just the bays themselves is certainly only part of the question of what these landforms are and where they might have come from. Uh, if you do hear about the sand dune sheets, it's because they're being interpreted as splash chevrons. Uh, the idea there is that impactors fell into river valleys like the Lynch's River Valley that's running from the top of the screen to the bottom here. And those impactors splashed material out of the valley and it went and fell on the surrounding landscape. And the fact that those lumpy landforms tend to be pointed away from the river valley uh, is evidence of that splash origin. Uh, the problem with that is that if you find these landforms on both sides of a river valley, as you see here, they point the same direction on both sides of the valley. Now, if there was a splash event, a splash in opposite directions, and that's not what you see here. Uh, they point the same direction because they're the result of, of windy conditions during past climates, specifically ice age climates. This area was much colder and drier. It wasn't glaciated, but a landscape in which very strong wind hitting river bluffs where sandy sediment layers are exposed was a landscape in which these big sand dune complexes could form. Uh, the fact that they point the same direction on both sides of the river valley is very good evidence that they don't have anything to do with splashing, that they are wind-related features. And if you want to take that a step further, you can actually look at sand dune complexes around the world today. Athabasca Dunes in Saskatchewan is a good example that matches up very nicely with what you see in coastal plain LIDAR. That is next to a big lake there in Saskatchewan, so go somewhere where there's no big body of water around. Nebraska sand hills, uh, beautiful parabolic sand dunes there as well. They have the nice chevron shape like you see in the LIDAR in coastal plain South Carolina. That shapes in the Athabasca dunes as well. And all of these are parabolic sand dune complexes. So you can feel very good about those LIDAR features on the coastal plain that the bays hang out with being windblown sand features. Uh, looking at a more detailed, smaller scale feature, that's one from Nebraska that just popped up. And those are some, again, in that coastal plain South Carolina LIDAR that match up very beautifully. Now, it's hard to imagine landforms uh, in Nebraska having anything to do with what's going on in swampy coastal plain South Carolina. But you have to keep in mind that the LIDAR features that we're seeing on the coastal plain are from a past climatic regime. Uh, those dunes aren't forming today. They're, they're only being worn down and eroded away. So the fact that we can still see them with LIDAR is sort of a window into the past. And they're presumably, uh, I would argue, very actually useful in trying to understand what Carolina bays represent to begin with. Um, do the bays interact with these sand dune sheets? Uh, yes, they do. Here you're looking at one where the sand dune sheet is, is sort of cut off by the bay. Now, does that mean that the dune sheet was migrating and it couldn't migrate past the bay because the bay was a water-filled lake? Does it mean that the bay actually cut off the end of the sand dune sheet? I don't know. I'm not sure if you can interpret that from looking at LIDAR alone. That may be possible, but one way or another, these landforms are interacting with each other. They share this old landscape. We could still see them with this LIDAR imagery. And relationships like that get even more interesting when the sand dune sheet actually comes from the bay itself, like you see here. Because in this case, the bay had to exist for that sand dune sheet to form. Now you see features, small lakes with sediment blowing downwind from them all around the world today. It's a progressive process. This isn't sort of an immediate overnight thing. That open depression has to be there with prevailing wind 
for that large amount of material to migrate downwind. These images are from uh, from Argentine Patagonia, actually. So Southern Hemisphere, but very high latitude, no vegetation to stop the wind or the sediment. And the wind direction is very plain to see from how that material spreads across the landscape. This is probably finer grain than sand, what you're looking at here, but it gives a very nice idea of what an open depression with a strong prevailing wind can produce in terms of landforms. Now, thinking about what these sand sheets might mean in terms of the history of bay formation, whether or not it was a one-time event or something that was progressive and continual as a result of landscape conditions, images like this are, are sort of interesting to think about. Got a big bay, got a sand dune sheet there. Looks like part of it is missing because a small bay sort of took a bite out of it. Um, that's interpreting based on LIDAR relationships, but I think it's pretty clear to see that the sand dune sheet coming off that big bay has been altered by that small bay's presence. Now, that sand dune sheet cannot jump over the small bay. Uh, it would have to totally cover it up to keep migrating, but it, it can't hop over it because sand dune migration requires a connectivity, if you will. Sand grains bounce along the top of the dune, fall off the slip face, and that's how the dune builds itself and, and migrates. So it's, it's a connected process. So having the gap, like you see across that small bay, uh, is not consistent with the dune sheet, uh, just, just sort of forming as if the bay were not there. Uh, the sand dune sheet, is a product of that big bay. It streams off of its southeast end. There's no question there. That sand sheet took time to form. So the suggestion here is that the big bay formed, the sand dune sheet formed, and that small bay formed later. So this would have been uh, a, a progressive process, at least two episodes of formation, and presumably uh, one in which bay formation was just kind of a constant thing. They'd form fill in with sediment, reach maturity, go away, whatever. But one way or the other, it wasn't a, it wasn't a one-time thing. I think there's better examples of this. This is down south of Sumter, South Carolina. Small bays there, beautiful sand sheets coming off their southeastern corners. And those small bays sit in the sand sheets coming off the corners of larger bays to their northwest. Now, in this case, those sand sheets of those bigger northwest bays, they, they have very large bites taken out of them. And most certainly those sand sheets could not have, have jumped those bays without covering them over first. So this is even better evidence that those bays whose sand sheets are highlighted now form first, they form those sand sheets and then the little bays to the south formed later and cut into and modified those pre-existing sand sheets. So when you got the sand dune complexes that are coming off the bays themselves, and then you got other bays messing with those, it's very good evidence that that the formation of these features was a, a progressive thing. It was a reflection of climatic and landscape conditions uh, and not a single catastrophic type of event. Can you see this elsewhere in the world? Did the Athabasca sand dune things? Uh, what about oriented depressions? Uh, with sand margins. Well, down here in the Falkland Islands, Islas Malvinas, high latitude, southern hemisphere, lots of prevailing wind. See these oriented lakes, and there are the ghostly remnants of older oriented lakes. They're now dried up. They've got a channel flowing across them, but they actually have very beautiful sand rims uh, on their southeastern side, and they certainly are, are present in the landscape. Those outlines are very clear to see. I imagine with LIDAR, this landscape probably looks something like uh, the coastal plain of South Carolina does today. More examples, uh, you see those ghostly outlines there, and you've got an active lake that is sort of cutting across the remnant lake right here in the middle of the screen. And again, were we to see this with LIDAR, that might look very much like a, a Carolina Bay relationship from the, uh, from the Atlantic coastal plain. So thinking about what these cross-cutting relations mean. Is, is this unequivocal? No, but in terms of how those dune sheets form and their direct relation to those northwest bays, one would get the sense that, that the formative process of the bays was progressive and gradual. And of all of those bays you see on the screen right now, 
uh, they probably have different ages and they existed for a period of time uh, before reaching their maturity and just becoming kind of a kind of a background part of the landscape. The sand dune sheets coming off those bays match up very beautifully uh, with the sand dune sheets coming off of the stream bluffs in the area as well. That makes that relationship to wind direction pretty easy to see. And that wind hypothesis, um, I've got some other stuff on here talking about it, suggestion that like oriented lakes elsewhere in the world today, wind direction uh, was a big formative part of Carolina Bay development in the past. So thinking about that cross-cutting relationship that you see right there, uh, I would argue is, is pretty important to trying to understand what these bays represent in the landscape. Um, thinking about the sand move is pretty interesting because you can do all this with Google Earth. Like, can you actually see moving sand trying to make its way around uh, little lakes? Yes, you can. Back to the Falkland Islands, 2016, 2019. If you keep your eye on the two small lakes down here, you can watch that growing sand dune. And it appears that little lakes, like the one you see up in the top here, actually... Uh, do serve as obstacles to dune migration, sort of have these shadows, if you want to call them that, where sand has not been able to, to move across the landscape because those lakes are in the way. The only way that, that the sand can move is through connectivity. So that dune has grown between the lakes and it's actually starting to fill in the northern of the two there. And if that little lake gets filled in all the way, then that sand sheet should be able to keep growing uh, across the landscape. This is another one that would be really cool to see with LIDAR uh, in terms of trying to match up patterns uh, that we see in the coastal plain with what's going on in that active landscape. So using that logic, would you expect to see the sand sheet on these pairs of bays sort of deflected like that? Uh, I would say so. Again, I don't think that the geometry of this sand sheet with this bay cutting across it uh, is something that could have formed if those bays existed at the same time. I think you have to have the big one existing first, the dune sheet developing, and then the smaller bay forming later. Uh, all kinds of complex relationships when you actually start looking closely at the landscape. The one you got here has some little bays within the sand sheet of a medium-sized bay, and then a sand sheet's actually covering a bay there on the eastern side. Uh, the topography is different here that bay that's getting covered is actually close to a river valley there all kinds of variables going on so in terms of, of why these relationships exist as they do i don't know but i think they become more digestible if you see the bays uh, again as progressively forming features in the landscape not sort of a sort of a one-time type of thing go back to the falklands uh it does actually look like the downwind sides of some of the larger oriented lakes tend to cluster a bunch of smaller lakes. Uh, those areas that are outlined in yellow are actually a little bit darker as well. Uh, does that mean there's sandy sediment there that you can't quite see because it's covered in vegetation? I don't know. Again, seeing this LIDAR would be really cool. But suffice it to say, there are potentially relationships like you see here reserved uh, in this modern day landscape as well. So the wind blown, the wind blown sand is, is really cool. I, I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of the, the Bay landscape and something that's really cool to check out. If you get on the national map and look at the LIDAR imagery is how all of the blown sand features line up so nicely. And they give you that, that sense of prevailing wind. Something else that you won't hear much when it comes to Bay orientation is that dune orientation changes along with bay orientation. So up at the top there, you got the Savannah River, Georgia, South Carolina line, got a nice parabolic dune there out in the river valley. And the bays there near Allendale, South Carolina are, first of all, not perfectly elliptical, but they're oriented with their long axes a little bit west to north. Lee County, South Carolina, Lynch's River, that dune sheet is pointing a little bit more to the northeast long axis of the bay is a little bit more to the west and north. And then finally, up in the Lumber River Valley, North Carolina, the dune sheet orientation has changed again, as has the bay orientation. So if you take lines from those dune sheets 
and compare them to those Bay axes. They are variable, they're geographically variable, but if you were to, to cruise all around the Lynch's River Valley, you would see dune sheets lined up like this and you would see bay orientations like that. So because bay orientation changes with dune orientation and the dune orientation is a product of wind direction, one might assume that, that, that there is some kind of a connection there, right? So taking stock of all of these landscape features, uh, not just the bays themselves, is an important part of of thinking about this question. Of course, the the bays are crazy to look at. I mean, the uh, the alignment, the the elliptical patterns, is very eye catching. But even though the dune sheets may not be quite as cool, um, they're a big part of what's going on as well. And when you're thinking about this problem, you got to remember that there's a lot more going on than just the craziest single pattern in the landscape, right? And if you get on national map, uh, which is what this LIDAR imagery was sourced from, I processed it up and put it in Google Earth here. But if you get on national map and turn on the stretch till shade function, you can cruise these landscapes and you can look at these dunes and the bays and you can actually see those relationships change for yourself. So check it out uh, and remember to always take a look at the details, ask yourself what's there and, uh, and don't get distracted by those really beautifully elliptical bays up there in the Lumber River, because they aren't the only thing that you can look at uh, when you're thinking about this question.